In the process of teaching over the years, what I've tried to do is just simplify it as much as I possibly can. Everybody in here knows that this game's hard enough as it is. There's so many variables out there. There's so many variables. I, I, I like to cut up about it because it seems to me that we've always been classified, Team Roper's been classified as the worst horseman in the world. And, and it's, in all honesty, we, we have got that reputation for the simple point that we don't know what we're doing with our left hand, what we're doing with our legs, how we're setting those horses up. And it should be just the opposite because when you've got two reins in your hands and your feet are underneath your shoulders, it's a heck of a lot easier to ride one, isn't it? But when you start swinging that rope and that balance changes in that saddle, then all of a sudden those horses start changing, that left hand starts moving, and, and we start picking up those bad habits. So what I've done this week, I'm going to do again today. I'm going to cover some of the basic stuff um, and walk everybody through it. You didn't, you didn't come over here to listen to me t teach you how to rope. That's not what my role is. My role is for us to understand those blueprints. I always, I always talk about it at my clinics, that if we don't have that foundation in place, it's hard for us to get better. And the first thing that we all do, is, and we've been through it, is we'll go out there and we may have a bad practice, so what's the first thing we, we do? We go work at it a little bit harder and we try a little bit harder and we run a few more steers and we run a few more steers, and, and it usually gets worse. And, and, I, and I like to say this, if it feels like you're working hard to do it, there's something in there that's wrong. If it felt like it was easy to do it, you did it right. Because you didn't put all that extra effort into it, and I'm not saying you don't have to work hard to get good at it. What I'm saying is, a lot of times that we create our own monsters, okay? For example, I like to start out on the head and side, and again, ground zero, but when, when I'm doing my heading seminars or my, my, my ground lessons on the heading, I'll walk you through a lot of the common mistakes that I see that we don't realize that we pick up because what you practice on the ground, you're going to take to your horse. And I'll, I'll, I'll stand around there at the arena and I'll watch people rope the dummy and when they rope the dummy, they'll step up and they'll rope the dummy and they'll, they'll do something like that right there. And because we catch that dummy, in our mind, we're convincing ourselves that we're doing it right. So we'll stand there and we'll practice and practice and practice and do it over and over and over. But what ends up happening right there is you're just creating muscle memory. You're creating those habits. Well, what happened right there is in my delivery, I, I rotated everything forward. My swing got out in front. I dropped over. And I can't even get all my slack out right here because I'm not balanced. OK? Here's where I'm going to tie my groundwork back into my horses. If I practice balance on the ground, then I'll have balance in the stirrups. So when I step up and rope the dummy, I may step right foot forward, I may step left foot forward, but I'm going to be balanced right here. Okay? I want to stay balanced on my own two feet because in my mind, I'm training my muscles and I'm training my feet to stay under my shoulders. Now, you'll never hear me say that you don't lean, because you do have to lean over at the waist to finish that delivery. But what ends up happening is if we practice this on the ground, pulling our slack like that, what we're actually practicing is moving our left hand left and staying over in that saddle. Left foot goes back and my horse steps out. How many of us have had that happen? Everybody, right? As opposed to staying square to my target. And when I say square to my target, this is my lane for my head horse. It's a three lane highway. I'm gonna ride my head horse in the left lane. But I've gotta square my shoulders to my target. And again, right foot or left foot forward. But whenever I rope, everything's balanced here. So when I pull my slack, I'm coming back on my slack to sit down to continue to ride my horse. And what that does is it keeps my feet underneath my shoulders. It also keeps my left hand in place. We can, we can talk about this every day, every day of what we're practicing here. And, and, I, and I know that I've, I've been through a lot of clinics with Walt Woodard, and he talks about the 21 days, and I think all those studies show that it takes 21 days to break or create a habit. And, and then we'll go out there whenever we're practicing, 
and we'll go catch a few and, and we'll get it locked in our mind that we're doing it all right. And the reason that we, we convince ourselves of that is because we caught. And what I try to get through to everybody is you've got to base your success in the practice pen on how you executed the catch. Not so much on the catch itself, because that's why you're in the practice pen, to work on getting better. But we put all that emphasis on whether or not we caught that steer. And if we caught that steer, we may have done most everything wrong and ended up catching, and we convince ourselves that we're okay. As opposed to working on, again, if I step up and I rope the dummy, I want to make sure that I'm in my spot. I want to make sure that my shoulders are square to my target. Whenever I do this, it makes it so much easier to open up and get my swing out sooner. Because by the time I get out here to 3 o'clock, I'm wanting to have that rope turned over. Now, I have a lot of people ask me this question. I have a hard time getting my rope to turn over. Their wrist, their wrist are either they've had surgery. It doesn't matter. If I swing my bottom strand in front, what do we have to do to catch? I'm not really getting that rope broke over. I just have to wait on the tip, and i got to slow it down to come across those horns. Okay? My, my, my stepdad's one of them. His shoulders don't work anymore. His wrist doesn't work anymore. So he swings off over here like that. But he'll very, very seldom miss because he waits on that tip to get all the way to that target and come across before he pulls the slack out. I'm going to lead into something here in a minute that is probably, there, there's two things that I want to make sure I go over. One, waving it off. It seems to be one of the number one questions. Why do, why do we pop it off the left horn? Why do I wave it off the left horn? Number two, my horse doesn't rate. A lot of times on slower cattle, my horse won't back off and rate for me. And those are, those are two of the most common questions asked that we can address pretty quick. The first one is waving it off, okay? And it's what I call a dead loop. You can study those loops and study those loops, and I'm big on using videotape. You can videotape yourself. But whenever I see head ropes coming off, and we've seen some of it happen here at the rodeo this week, right? We've really seen it more so on those steers that are a little bit lower headed. But what ends up happening is we don't, we're not able to finish the delivery. And what I mean by that is we're not able to get the eye of that rope up to the base of that horn. So what ends up happening right here is if, this, if we deliver our rope and we stop about right there to start pulling slack, we're not finishing the delivery, so it leaves the eye of the rope back here. So when it comes out and it starts to curl, does everybody see where the tip's at? Now look at the difference if I push that up. Where does it allow that tip to go? Does that, does that help any of you on, on waving it off? And, and it's the most common thing you see. It's the most common thing you see. You'll see it a lot on shorter horn cattle. Why? Shorter horns, all right? And the fact that we go to picking at them. It's always amazed me. I, I, I've watched David Key rope, you know, steer after steer after steer, and he'll reach and drop two coils at one, have horns that long on each side, and keep it on them the big finish. Always finish that delivery before you pull that slack out. Okay? Little things like that. But don't overanalyze it because I told you when I started I want to keep this as simple as I possibly can. We're going to make it harder than what it is. But if 80% 80, 80 of this game is horsemanship, it seems to me that we put 80% of our effort into this. Okay? We put 80% of the effort into this. Now, I'm going to lead you in to those horses not wanting to back off. Had a guy come in my booth the other day and say, my horse feels really, really good on fast steers. And then I'll draw a slower steer, and he doesn't want to back off. He just wants to step right through me. He wants to step through my throw. Here's what ends up happening. Whenever we leave the corner of the box, something this simple, if we leave the corner of the box and when we nod our head and we pick our chin up and we leave forward like that where, does that, where does that put all my momentum? Over that horse. So where does my first swing go? Up. 
as I'm running to that steer, and now I've got that slower steer, where's the tip of my rope? It's still up in the air. First thing I want to do is what? Start pulling. When I start balancing on that horse's face and it, it sits me straight up in that saddle, now I'm square to my horse's head again and not square to my target, so it gets me rocked back like this. And I'll, ha I'll have students come to me all day long, every day, and say, I hate slow steers. I hate slow steers. I can't catch them. I'm like, I want you at the rodeos I go to, okay? Because you don't win money on fast steers, okay? What we need to do is when we leave the corner of that box, if we'll open and square up to our target, so you're going to roll your shoulders like that, then it sets all this to where your tip's down. When you get there, you're ready to go into your delivery. And what I mean by that is you can take those horses that want to be a little bit strong right there and are pushing through you, and as they're going, if they're running through you right there, don't get in a tug-of-war contest with them because you're going to lose. Let go of your rope and sit down. Let go of your rope and sit down, just like the breakaway rope. Horsemanship 101, how do we stop our horses? Sit down and quit riding. Agreed? Instead, we go to getting in that tug-of-war contest, and it doesn't matter what bitch you put in their mouth. You can put an 8-inch shank on them with a 3-inch port, and you're still not going to get them backed off. Because all you're doing now is giving them that balance. That balance, and that balance that they've got now is that bit. They get to push into it. But whenever I stay opened up, and I'm in this position right here, <clears throat> excuse me, when I'm in this position right here and I'm going to my target, everything is set for me to catch. Now, if I want to sit here and maintain, I can. If my horse backs off, I can sit here and swing. If my horse pushes through me, the first thing I'm going to do is let it go, sit down, and relax. And I may sit there. Another thing for you headers, how many of you have gone up there and roped those same steers like that and then we pull that slack and we hold that slack to let that horse relax it, and we'll just track them down the arena. And they'll stay there all day, won't they? They'll stay there all day. When do they start to make their move? When you go from here to here. So something that simple, what would be my goal? Whenever I rope and I rip that slack out, I'm going straight to the horn. And then I'm going to make my horse stay there. That's where I want that horse to soften and relax. That's where I want my horse to stay gathered up and collected and relaxed. Okay? Does anybody have any questions about what I just went over? Because that, that's the great thing about this seminar is it is a you know, Q&A to where we can go over the stuff that anybody might be having problems with. And I promise you, if you are having problems, somebody else has had that same problem. Same questions. <clears throat> been sick the last couple of days, so my, vote, my throat's getting a little scratchy. Any questions about it? Hey, gang, the reason... It's just me. All right, the, the reason that I talked about this right here, right foot forward, left foot forward, is I don't want you to make more of it than what it is. I teach left foot forward at my clinics mainly my beginner clinics because I'm trying to get my students to think about getting their shoulders to that target. But I also know a lot of people that rope really, really well and they step right foot forward and there's nothing wrong with that. But every one of those people that I know that rope really good that step right foot forward, see where my shoulder stayed? And if that right foot comes forward, it's, they're staying square over there, okay? So don't make more out of the right foot or the left foot. I do teach left foot forward because I'm trying to get my students to think about keeping those shoulders square to that target. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Is there a way to, uh, what exercise you use to, to get the students to concentrate on the follow through? Like I tend to stop short mm -hmm. and not go through? Yeah, just slow down. I mean, the, the, what, what ends up happening, and, and I, I did a little demo yesterday, is we usually get in front of our tip, okay? I relate golfing and roping together. And if any of you were here yesterday, I kind of did this little tail drill. I'm not a good golfer by any means. 
but I know that you hit the golf ball with the club head. The club head's the furthest piece from your hands. And when I step up and go to hit a golf ball, I try to hit with my grips. My hands come all the way through while the club head's still back here. I go to the first tee box, I end up going to the chiropractor, I don't even get to play the next hole. So what ends up happening is the slowest part of our, our run right there is the delivery. And if you will learn to slow it down, you can pick your rope speed up, but if you'll learn to slow that down, then you'll bring your hands together and finish. You know, the, to finish that delivery like what we were just talking about a minute ago, and, and, and to answer your question, how many people do you see do a one-hand delivery? They get, their, their muscle memory is so locked into place that they'll do that. So your rope is actually trying to go to the target, so you extend it into your target, but you're also pulling it away from your target because your left hand didn't extend with it. So slow it all down. If you want to be fast with something right there, just be fast with your slack. And, 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 and it'll lead me into the, the next question. What do you look at when you rope? Do you look at the right horn? Do you look at the base of the horns? Do you look at the left horn? You know, I'm not going to sit here and say that there's one certain spot on there that you need to be focused on. Because I've had students that have a hard time getting that tip over to that right horn. They start leaking out in front. And when that swing gets out in front, they get hung right there and they lose their balance and it makes it harder to get that tip over there. So I'll tell them to start focusing more on the right horn so we're getting that tip back over there. When we start catching that right horn, then we can start moving back across. I look at the middle of the left horn. The reason I look at the middle of the left horn is I have the confidence in my swing that I've already got the right horn caught. I want to finish what I start. So whenever I'm going into that, my tip is already set outside and it's down, so it's coming across my target. I want to look at the, that left horn before I start pulling that slack out. And it makes me reach for it. But again, I, I, I think there's, there's so many different ways that we could look at, you know, what am I doing? How am I doing it? What's wrong? And the best thing that we can do in our mind is we know that the bottom strand goes under the right horn and the top strand over the left horn. Let's present it that way. Because in your swing, you're actually presenting your tip, right horn, left horn. Do you catch both horns at the same time? Most people do. Most people do. Okay, did that help you any? Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. If your horse is not rating and you're squared up to your target, how do they rate? Well, good, great question, great question. If I come out of the box and I open up like this, I'm going to be more centered in the middle of my saddle to help my horse because my feet are going to stay more under me. The other thing that it helps me do is it actually helps me ask my horse for a left lead departure because when I open up, my right leg goes against my horse. How many of us have had that happen to us that we go to those steers and we actually break in our lane and as we get to them, our horse falls into the steer and we get stuck right here. And then once we get stuck right here, then we got to ride back away. All that means is we crawled out over that right stirrup and we put our body weight over that horse's right shoulder and it pulled him in. First thing that we're going to do right there is we're going to take our left hand and try to move that horse away. Well, all that does is move his head and his shoulder. When it moves the head and the shoulder, guess what foot's still back? The left foot's still back and it pushes the hip into the steer. Now your horse is completely weak. They've got to log out of there. If you get one caught, they've got to log out of there off of their rib. Okay? So, helping your horse rate, if you open up right there and I go run into that steer and I realize that he's a little bit slower, I'm just going to quit riding. I'm going to sit down and relax a little bit more to help my horse back off a little bit sooner. But the key is getting your tip down. And, and I'll talk about it on the healing side of it too. I, I've seen so many ropers get to position and have the shot and they're ready to catch, they just can't let go of the rope. They can't let go of the rope because their tip's up. And when it's up, you've got to take those extra two swings to pull it back down. Well, all we've done at this stage is really teach our horse to step through that delivery. Because you do it enough, that's what's going to end up happening. 
if I'm able to go to that target with my tip down, then I'm ready. Okay? Watch those videotapes. Every one of those videotapes that are out there, like the Hort Dog, and, and I say the videotapes, we can watch it on the NFR runs and so forth as well. But you can watch the Hort Dog, you can watch the BFI, you can watch the U.S. Finals, and when those headers leave there, they're opened up, swing out, tip down instantly. That way when they get to position, they're going into a delivery. They don't take the extra swing or two. They don't take the extra swing or two. We talk about, you know, do we swing big, do we swing small? Now, that's the only difference in rope speed. If I want to tighten my, get more rope speed, I'll just tighten my swing, my swing circle down. If I want a bigger swing, you know, bigger horns, I may open my swing up a little bit more to make sure that I get a bigger loop out there. But your, your swing is going to be timed up with your horse's stride. And a lot of times when it's not, I, Tyler used to talk about this all the time, he'd say less is more, and what he meant by that is a lot of headers would get to position and they'd had the shot set up, but they wouldn't take the shot because they weren't in time with their horse. It's a lot easier to go into that delivery when your horse is coming down than it is coming up. Well, when, when we're on those head horses, everything's still moving forward, right? Everything's still moving forward. It's not like a heel horse where there's a big rate right there. So when that happens, if you'll just back your, back your delivery off and slow it down, then that horse will time back up to your delivery. Instead, what do we, nine times out of 10, what do we do? We speed it up and jam it on there. And when we jam it on, we split the horns. Again, going back to my golf swing, I'm just getting in front of the tip of my rope. Okay? Good questions. Have I, have I touched on anything so far that's happened to us? Every day. Every day. I'm going to talk a little bit about scoring those head horses. <clears throat> and when I talk about this, again, it, it's all stuff that, that I've used over 20 years of teaching to try to help students make it as simple as they possibly can. And I see so many headers that when they back in the box, they'll get set in the box and their hand will be stuck out here like this, okay? And it's what I call that free air. <laughs> Your hand's just floating around in this free zone out here. Well, if I nod my head, see how my hand can still move? If that horse jumps and does that right there, does everybody see how my hand can still move? Well, that's a cue. Every time you have an action, your horse is going to have a reaction. And we all know, gates bang, they're anticipating, right? The reason they anticipate is because we anticipate. So if we'll get set in the corner of that box and we'll lock in, and what I mean by locking in is get your arm, your left arm set to where either you're against your saddle horn, against your stomach, or your arm is locked to where when you nod your head, nothing moves. If that horse pitter patters, you're just still locked in. Then you feed and open and go from there. I, I've had a guy that's been coming over uh, for lessons for the last month and a half, and same deal. Rope for four or five years, laid off for a year and a half, two years, came back, wanted to start over, completely start over. I couldn't get him to get his tip down and get him ready until I got him scoring his horse better to be ready. That hand was stuck right here. He'd nod, he'd pull. First thing happens, he'd come out, his chin's up, tips up. One, two, three, four, five. You know, he never could get ready. As soon as we spent a full day of practicing, just scoring our horse and leaving flat, he was able to open up and get his tip down and catch cattle that he's never caught before. And what I mean by that is two or three strides out of the box. I wasn't trying to teach him to rope fast, I was just trying to get him ready and he didn't have to work to do it. It just made it that much easier. But because his hand was stuck right here for so long, that muscle memory is in place, as soon as he'd nod his head, come up. When he'd come up, the tip come up. Okay? You got that horse running up into you instead of staying flat and out of your way. And I, and I always say this. I, 99.9% .9 of the time, it seems to me like when we run into roadblocks with our horses, we always want to go change something, right? We want to change the bit. Might go take your spurs off. 
go, go get a different rope. We're looking for some reason why it didn't work. And when we go to looking for that reason, all we really need to do is get off, go to the bathroom, look in the mirror, and talk to ourselves, and we can figure it out pretty quick. And then go back and get on. Okay? Not saying that your horses are always going to be perfect. That's not what I'm getting at. But those horses won't become consistent, and they won't get right until we become consistent and get right. But I, I practice everything that I just talked to you about right there goes right back to what I was started out talking about on the ground, my balance. My balance. The last thing I'm going to talk about on the head and side is when we get our arms out here like this, if I'm picking up on my horse and I get my hands close together, where's all my balance going to be now? It's going to be forward. It's going to be out over my horse. <coughs> Y'all all remember this. The heaviest part of your body is from your waist up. The heaviest part of the horse's body is the heart girth forward. So when I put one over the top of the other, how's that horse running now? They're laboring to work, aren't they? They're laboring to run. Okay? If this deal right here worked, these horses wouldn't have a, they wouldn't have any trouble at all running with me stuck out over their shoulders. Okay? When I get this hand here, my hands are further apart, it gives me more balance in my stirrups. For all you right-handed ropers, it's going to be your left hand and your left foot, which is going to dictate so much of what you do with this piece of your rope. If you don't have balance, you're not going to be able to control the tip of that rope like you want to. And that's where we've got to be better with our rope, okay? But if we want to make it easier, and I cut up yesterday, I cut up yesterday about this. When we go out there and we start young horses, if I go out there and every one of us get a three-year-old or a four-year-old, and they've never been roped on before, got them broke, right around pretty good, and we're going to start patterning them to track cattle. Do you stand up when you go out there on that first steer to rope and crawl out over them, or do you sit right in the middle of them and go up there and show it to them, let them see it? What would you do? Why would you sit down and ride them into that? Y'all can cut up with me. Because you don't want to get bucked off, right? That horse is not a finished horse. Doesn't know what they're doing. When you go out there and warm your horses up, are you standing up, crawled out over their shoulders? Or are you sitting in the middle of them, riding them forward to warm them up? I haven't seen one of these barrel racers yet this week. In fact, I haven't ever seen one that I know of. If I did, it was, it was uh, by accident. But it, they come running down that center alleyway and they get to that first barrel and right before they get to that first barrel they stand up and crawl out over their horse's shoulders. How come they don't do that? They're getting ready to end up in the grandstands, right? They sit down. They get in that pocket to ride that horse. Haven't ever been to a reining horse competition. That they go out there and they lope their circles, fast circle, slow circle, and they come out of it and then they get ready to run that horse down the center of the arena and slide them 20 foot to a stop. And right before they say, whoa, they stand up and move forward over them. Right? They sit down to ride those horses into that. Because if that horse is balanced and that horse is collected, they can move a lot faster on their motor, which is their rear end. We keep their motor in gear, then we can control them. But when we start making it labor intensive for them, by putting our body weight over their shoulders, now their shoulders get heavy and the rear end comes up and they can't collect force. Okay? Does that help y'all understand the picture a little bit better? I, I'm, I'm always amazed at Trevor because, I mean, how does a guy go out there and win the world in the calf open and the head in the same year? Because everybody carries on about how difficult it is. What, I mean, everybody knows he can rope. Nobody outworks him. But how does he go win those two events in the same year? Horsemanship. He rides his calf roping horses like a calf roper. He rides his head horses like a header. He helps those horses do their job. And the more balanced he stays in that saddle, the more consistency he is with this rope. Okay?